doing the small things and doing it in a great way, one day that will give you great things to do. Welcome to the Cleaning Up Podcast, Millionaire Secrets of the Home Services Industry, brought to you by me, Ron Holt, CEO and founder of Two Maids and a Mop, America's fastest growing cleaning company. I get a chance to sit down with home service industry pros and other entrepreneurial leaders so they can share their stories, their insight, their experiences. It's so much fun. You're going to learn so much. And you're going to be inspired to take your small business into a national brand just like I did. Let's jump right into the interview. I'm proud and honored to um, introduce Gigi. Uh, Gigi Butler is the CEO and founder um, of Gigi's Cupcakes and um, so many great things about Gigi. Number one, at one point in her life, she owned her own cleaning business. So that's that's going to be a fun story to talk about. Two, she was a franchisor at some point later on, even a franchisee. Right. And she's written a book, uh, a book that I think a lot of people here will, will really be able to relate to um, that I, I want to talk more about later on as well. So Gigi, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I love it. You bet. <laughs> I feel like a maid with two mops. <laughs> <laughs> right now, that's all I'm doing is cleaning. But I know. I case, yeah. but I've had a I've had a mop in my hand or a broom in my hand, uh, my whole life. So I completely understand that concept of cleaning. Well, let's go back to when that first started, because I'm it, I I think that from reading your book and and just learning more and more about you, the the life lessons, the business lessons that you learned while cleaning homes really have stayed with you for your entire life. Um, right. so obviously, with the line of business that we are all in at Two Maids and a Mop, uh, I, I'd, I'd love to talk about some of those early motivations, why you clean homes, and then what some of the learning experiences were that we can we can also learn from. So this started as a teenager, right? You were cleaning homes in right. 15 I, years old. Uh, I would say my dad was a serial entrepreneur, so we were always taught just do it and go for it, and if you fail, you fail. I was taught to feel fear, but go ahead and go around the fear and fight fear and use fear as your motivator, not as a stumbling block. And so my dad, we had every potbelly pig business, uh, arcades, uh, just everything. He was a, a fireman and, and we had restaurants. And so at seven, I knew that I was going to be a country music singer songwriter. And I announced that to my family over dinner. And I'm like, I'm going to be a singer songwriter. I'm moving to Nashville. <laughs> They're like, okay, so how can I get to that goal? So I knew I needed to start a business or do something. And I didn't want to work for McDonald's or work for Gap. Or I was more of an independent because I've seen my dad do it so much. So I bought some mops and buckets at age 15. And I knocked on doors at a, an assisted living place about a mile from my house because I still couldn't drive. I was 15. And that was the birth of Gigi's cleaning company. And that saw me through until I had 13 franchises open of cupcakes. So we're talking 20 year span. I have cleaned more than 65,000 toilets in my lifetime. <laughs> and I am proud of that. I have got the calluses and scars to show it. And I think hard work has been the backbone of my life. And I think if people work hard and they're persistent, things pay off. And it may not be what you think it's going to be, but if you keep doing the right thing first, good things always follow. So uh, yeah, cleaning at 15 and I knew I didn't know what I was doing. And then I got into commercial cleaning and construction cleaning. So I would go to these big construction sites and here I was this little 18 year old, 17 year old kid bidding on a house of pancakes or a blockbuster video. And all these big contractors were just like laughing at me because I underbid, but I learned so much about negotiations and life, you know, life lessons on how to treat people and how to be a better boss. And you know, that's, I've, I've been in your shoes. We actually focus on residential cleaning here at Two Maids and a Mop. But in those early, early days as a founder, we focused on anything that paid us a dollar. Right. Um, so right. we did anything and everything. And <laughs> this new construction job are uh -oh. hard work. <laughs> I had so many razor blades in my hand, you know, take, picking off uh, the plaster. Oh, oh, God, windows. I don't miss that. I don't miss it. <laughs> right. I don't miss the dust, but I learned so much from that. And 
God has been so good to me. He's blessed me with work always. And I, I just, I think the best thing you can ever be is blessed with work. I, I, I totally agree. In, in fact, if you, if you feel that way, it almost doesn't feel like work. You know, it feels like you're, you're sort of living this dream come true. Um, and maybe someone from the outside sees what you're doing and they, they consider it work. Uh, and maybe I've even had people go, gosh, you're working so hard. And I'm like, huh? Yeah. I, I, I'm having fun. What do you mean? Yeah, right. <laughs> this isn't work. Yeah. Like, give me 50 toilets a day. That's work. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> so at some point you, you were in California, right? That's where you. Yeah. you were I was born in Oklahoma, but I was raised in, on a farm in California in the high yeah. desert. And then I moved to Nashville. Oh, 1994. And just had, you know, had my dream and worked at Red Lobster until I built up my client clients for my cleaning business again and clean, clean during the day and then sang at night downtown Tootsies and sang at the fair circuit and all across the country, different parts of the world, did music demos. And I was working towards my dream, but the cleaning business offered me so much flexibility because I could, you know, make my own hours and be my own boss. And that was a really important thing for me. So I bet you got some good Tootsie stories. Uh, oh, I got some good ones. <laughs> That's in my book. Right. <laughs> that had to be uh, a crazy lifestyle, cleaning, working all day. Um, and, and you right. were just, you were cleaning, but you're still running a business, you know, like, like we've learned in, in our own business. You know, it, it has the same components of any other business, even though it's, not quite as glamorous as some of the others, you know, and right. not to mention if, if you're in the booking business for entertainment, that's, that's its own business. So you were going through this almost hard knocks college type preparatory um, to get you ready for right. business later on. It, it seems like. Right. The things I've gone through are priceless. A Harvard, a Harvard degree could not give me what I have learned on my own by just hard knocks. So the school of hard knocks, I have a PhD in. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how, how long were you in Nashville um, cleaning? You know, how many years did that go? I know you said after Gigi's even started, you were still cleaning, but we'll get to Gigi's here in a bit. But how many years were you just in the cleaning world and the entertainment world at night? Well, I was, uh, so I would, I would get up about nine o'clock. I'd start cleaning from 10 to about four. Then I'd come home and take a nap, and then I'd sing from 10 p.m. until 2 a.m. So <clears throat> then I'd probably sing three or four nights a week, so I had some nights off. But um, So I would do that. <clears throat> so it was more of a night out. And so once again, the cleaning provided that I could sleep in. I mean, if I didn't get to bed till 3 or 4, I could at least sleep till 9 and then get up and clean all day and then take a nap. And so it worked for me, and it was a great experience. And I was about 29 still cleaning and I, I was almost 30 and I started cleaning a house for a, a new family in town and they had a daughter who was 15 and full of musical talent and she's amazing and I was cleaning her bathroom one day and she's 15 years old and I remember I was cleaning her soap dish and she played a guitar she was practicing guitar on her bed and she played a song called teardrops on my guitar and she played that song I looked at her and I was like, did you write that song? She goes, yeah, it's going to be on my first album. I, I thought, I said, that's fantastic. She goes, well, hello. Like, hello, I'm Taylor Swift. Hello. <laughs> you don't know me yet, but the whole world will. And I was, I was shocked. I'm like, I'm 15. She's 15. I'm almost 30. I'm cleaning her toilet. I've been here for 10 years. And you know, there's just no way. So I packed my cleaning supplies in my truck that night and I drove home and I was devastated. I was brokenhearted. Like my whole life since I was seven, that's all I wanted to do. Cleaning was just something I had to do to make money to support my dream. But <clears throat> when your dream dies and you know it's time to have a new dream, it's not an easy thing. That's not an easy transition. It's something that has to be done, but that doesn't mean that that's easy. It means that it's, you're going to go through so many emotional trials and identity crisis and I'm a loser. Where, where am I? I'm just, clean. you know, it just, there were so many things that I was going through at that time, but it took about two, two years to really come back to be like, okay, 
if I'm just going to be a cleaner, I'm just going to have a house cleaning business, then I'm going to be the Wonder Woman of cleaning, ladies. So I just decided to expand my cleaning business at that time and hire girls and, and do, do everything that you all are doing. And it was just a, a wonderful time of my life because I finally found peace in just being that. And I really loved it. And I love cleaning because you get to be around so many people and in people's homes. And it was just, it was just a great time. Right. And you're making a difference. You know, you can feel that difference. You can see it. But let's, let's, let's unpack that real quickly. We cleaned Taylor Swift's home. Mm -hmm. That's, that had to be, I mean, as she continued to grow, uh, become a mega star like she is now. I'm looking back on that. That has to be almost surreal. <laughs> it was surreal. I cleaned Lee and Rhymes' home, Libra Parnell. I'm, I can't. I can't even tell you all the people's homes. Chris Cagle. I, I just I've had cleaned for all the management companies in the you know in the music industry. I've cleaned for most of those people. And just the lessons that I learned in their homes, doctors, lawyers, and I may not have been going to business school, but when I'm dusting someone's desk and he was one of the leading hedge fund guys and he's showing me how, what to buy and what not on stock. And it was just, it's just a life experience that you just can't get anywhere else. Right. That's such a cool story. So how many years did you exclusively focus on the cleaning business, Gigi's cleaning service? Uh, about three years, about three years. What, what, uh, I know that Gigi's Cupcakes is really the um, your sort of bread and butter and right. pardon the pun, um, you know. But what what are some of the what are some fun stories that you can remember? Because I mean, you you guys were were a big deal during those three years in Nashville. It sounds like you you guys were a really popular, busy for cleaning cupcakes service. or cleaning? well for the cleaning service. Now we'll we'll hit the cupcakes here in a bit, but yeah. Um, oh, oh gosh, we just it was just a wonderful time and I cleaned so many people in the music industry down on Music Row. And so when I opened my first cupcake shop right off of Music Row, people were like, oh, that's the cleaning lady's place. Let's go somewhere. <laughs> so it was really cool. I had so many, so many people supporting me. And I think people admire, no matter what you do, if you work hard, people admire that. And I think that's what helped me most is that people admired my hard work in the cleaning and I always tried to do the small things in a great way. And if you do small things in a great way, like it's whether it's picking up a lamp to dust underneath it, when you don't, you know that they're not going to know, but you still need to do it or, or moving a chair and vacuum. You know what I'm talking about. Of you know course. what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> right? And be like, well, do I need to move that? Doing the small things and doing it in a great way one day that will give you great things to do because if you're, if you're loyal and you're a good steward with small things, God gives you big things. So, but you have to be trusted with the small things first. And that's what I learned so much about. Is there a penny on the floor? Is there, you know, about honesty and about integrity and you can be, you learn so much cleaning how to be honest and have integrity. If you don't have that, you're not going to be a good cleaner and you won't have a lot of people. You won't have one o'clock clients. Right. That's the basis. The reason why people have you in their home is because they trust you. And if you break that trust, you're not a good cleaner and you won't have a lot of business. Right. Well, at some point um, during all the, the busyness of, of cleaning all the different people across town, you, right. you experimented with some of your culinary skills and uh, became excited about a different line of business. I did. So I had great credit, excellent credit. And I had a little bit of savings and I'd been in business like 15 years at that time, 16 years. And I was cleaning a bathroom and I've always loved to bake. My whole family bakes, my aunts, my great aunts, my great, great grandmother in the turn of the century. So I've always baked and always done that, but I never thought I'd be doing it for a living. And another lesson I learned is always be open to other gifts that you have to, is to scale that. You may never even think, oh, I'm an artist, but I, well, what if you scaled something that you really love and you're really good at? So I thought, hmm, what about that? I was cleaning a toilet, another house, another client's or bathroom, and my brother called. He had stood in line in New York City 
for two hours at a cupcake shop, a famous cupcake shop. And while eating a red velvet cupcake, he called me, he's like, you should open a cupcake shop in Nashville. Your cupcakes are better than theirs. And I thought, hmm, why not? Why not me? And so that's where the idea happened. And I went to four banks. They laughed in my face completely. They're like, cupcakes? Are you kidding me? No way, just cupcakes. I'm like, yeah, it's going to work out. It'll be great. And so they laughed in my face. So I ended up taking, because I had excellent credit. And that's another thing. If you build your credit when you're young, credit, good credit helps you in so many ways when you're older. And so I took $100,000 cash advances on my credit cards and I opened the first GGs. Wow. Well, I, I told you this offline, but I'll share it with everyone else. So as I was growing two maids in the mob, one of the crazier ideas and thoughts and notions that, that I thought I needed to do was to move to the market that we were opening. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, the first six markets I relocated, obviously didn't have children at the time. And, uh, at some point during that growth, I, I got married as well. But one of the stores was Nashville, Tennessee. It's actually our sixth store. And uh, my wife was still in Birmingham. Um, she, she had said, I'm not doing this whole tour of the country thing. You know, right. you do what you got to do and then come back. Right. But Nashville and Birmingham are, are you know, driving distance from one another. And so right. on the weekends, she would come up. And we, again, we were young, no kids. So we had fun. We had a lot of fun on the weekends in Nashville. Right. But your 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 original store um, uh, there in Nashville just was near Vanderbilt, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, our office was somewhat near there, at least not the office, but where my apartment was that I was living in was near there. It was not a very nice apartment, by the way. Um, but I remember one Friday afternoon, I had had a long, long, hard week. <laughs> Two maids in the mop of Nashville. And I was across the street at the bar. Um, what did you call it? The Broadway? The Broadway Brew House. Yeah. And mm -hmm. next door was, was Gigi's Cupcakes. And I knew Rachel, my wife, was coming into town. And so I had a, I had a couple beers with some friends. And then I walked across the street and I got a couple cupcakes. And uh, I had them ready for my wife when she arrived for the weekend. And it was the best thing ever. She was like, thank you so much. And I'm like, she didn't know I had the two beers before her. <laughs> that's that's how I was first introduced to your business. That's really neat. Well, uh, Gigi's cupcakes was it, it really was a treat and a gift, and the box was so beautiful. So I think that's the reason why it worked so well because they were so beautiful, and you gave it as a gift, like oh, a little box of goodness. Here you go, you know. So everyone felt special. So the right, beautiful reps would love us and. I mean, oh, is that a Gigi's? Well, you can't come in without a Gigi's. Don't you dare bring us Kroger cupcakes anymore. So we set the standard, which I'm really proud of. And I love because it was my first baby that came. Well, second baby, actually. My cleaning business was my first. But right. it was uh, something that I put my heart and soul into in my whole entire life and my future and $100,000 in credit cards. So I had to work. Well, I was well, work. That original... $33 and original $100,000 credit card investment eventually turned into a $42 million enterprise, you know, so right. with 90 plus locations across the country. It's, right. That's right. a, that's the American dream come true, you know? So yeah. I, uh, you know, I'm living that now, you know, we're growing, we have 85 stores open across the country and I've been right. in this freaking thing for 17 years now. April 1st is uh, our, our birthday. So we're just now 17 years old. Um, and so, you know, we're still trying to, to climb the roller coaster. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested just from my own perspective, just to sort of learn a little bit about that roller coaster you, you went on, you know, so what were, what were some of the experiences you learned as, um, just an entrepreneur getting this to a place where it could scale into a franchise brand. And then we'll move into as a franchise or what some learning lessons were there that maybe we could all learn from as, as franchisees ourselves. Well, those are great questions. And uh, first question is, or what your first answer is that you really have to know your brand. You have to be branded well. If you don't know your brand, no one else will. So that's what I've really learned in famous people's homes, which is really interesting cleaning for them. And in Nashville, they call it your shtick. Like you have to have something unique and different. So I learned branding even when I was cleaning. So <clears throat> when I did the cupcake shop, I knew that it had to look as beautiful as it 
taste it because people eat with their eyes. And so that was my first goal to make sure that it looked like a work of art because that would set us apart. <clears throat> so that was one of the things. And then I knew that it had to taste fabulous. And when you smelled, you came into the store, you would smell like it was your grandma's house when you were 10 years old and, oh, and it would take you back. And then when you ate it, it would really be exactly what I said it was. And Scarlet's Red Velvet, when you ate a Scarlet's Red Velvet, it wasn't just like, eh, it was like, oh my gosh, or the dreamsicle, orange dreamsicle. I wanted it to taste so flavorful that when you ate an orange dreamsicle, it would taste like you went and chased down the, the uh, ice cream truck on a hot summer day in your neighborhood. Like that, that push pop, you know, that orange push pop, sh you know, sherbet type of thing. So the, the taste, the quality, I was a stickler on because in my cleaning, I had learned that if you do the small things in a great way, you'll get big things. So I've always wanted to do the small things in a great way. And if it came to a cupcake or the branding of my box or doing what we say we're going to do, that's the most important thing to me. And I think that's, that encompasses branding. I totally agree with you. Um, you know, in our world, we've got our pay for performance plan. That may be a bit of a foreign term to you, but basically every time we clean someone's home, we give our customers an opportunity to rate their level of satisfaction on a pretty simple scale of just one to 10. Right. That number actually determines our employees' wages, their paycheck. So oh. We, oh. we say that to anyone and everyone that will listen. And that's sort of our stick, and it's not just our only stick, but it's certainly What's what. Your average rate? I bet your average rate is eight and a half. Well, you know, it's it's micro, it's all local based, but as a whole, actually, it's above nine. Nine, I don't know the exact number, but you know, nine point one two, something like that, that's one or two, I should say. Um, we, you know, we uh, we're not perfect. Um, there's no. no such thing as that in the cleaning world or any business, for that matter, in my opinion. Uh, we're actually going through this whole customer experience revolution within our brand. Um, and so uh, I know we're talking cupcakes, but it, whether it's cupcakes or cleaning, it doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter. For someone to want to do business with you, right. it has to be a relationship, a bond, it has to be very strong right. for them to want to continue to do business with you. And right. so I think for a long time here, in our world at least, we've taken that for granted because the demand for our services have always been so strong mm -hmm. that it just feels easy just to get another customer. Right. Um, and then we just sort of take losing a customer for granted right. um, as a result. But how strong, how, how, how crazy would it be um, in terms of success and growth if we were to actually keep those customers instead of just keep going through them like a revolving door? Right. And so customer experience is something that, you know, you even talked about it with the way the, the store should smell. You know, yeah. that first instinct, that first impression you have will stick with you and it sets the tone for everything else um, all the way to, you know, after you finish the cupcake. Right. Um, we're trying to create that same type of experience here at Two Maids and Mop. And wow. we've sort of used, we've made this year, 2020, is sort of that year to make the change. Obviously, the outbreak of the virus has, right. you know, put us in a different place. Um, we're just trying to survive right now, but once we get beyond it, we will, um, you know, we're going to return to that, that real, I think, I know it's a crazy word, but revolution where we are completely changing the experience our customers um, will experience when they are served by us. So I think that's uh, the most important thing you can do. I think a person, if you build trust with a customer and you really build, now you're not going to be able to please every customer. I've had the pickiest people in the world. You cannot please everybody. There is someone out there will, that will nitpick you to death. And you can't, that's why you got the 9.2. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's that one point person that did all, oh, but you're like, do I need this customer? Is it this, is it worth it? But I think being able to create trust within your brand and people really can trust you. I think that's going to build you and the customer service is where they trust you. Right. It's just that communication, communication. So I think that's a great idea for you. And I think you'll only grow. You'll only get better and you'll only expand if you truly want and desire the customer to be thrilled with your work. That's, that's, that's the key. And I, I've taken a long 10 years, 12 years to really understand that. 
and I, it's a new revolution for me as well. And I, I, I'll talk about that when with my new thing, but I, I've had to learn that in the last 12 years, just doing cupcakes too. So. Right. Well, at some point you, you uh, took that original store and right. you grew it, like I said, into $42 million worth of nationwide revenue. Right. You were in 90 plus markets. Right. Uh, what are some of I took it to 120 stores. Oh, wow. 120 stores. <clears throat> 120 uh, stores in, in 24 states. So what was like life like for you? Were, just, were you just on the road traveling store to store every day? Oh, my gosh. Well, the first year, I was still cleaning, and I still have my cleaning girls. And my, my landlord became a partner in, in the franchise company with me. And he's like, you cannot clean anymore. You've got to stop. I didn't stop cleaning until I had 13 stores open. And I'm like, no, that's my baby, you know, because we don't want to let go of what we're used to and what we're comfortable with. He's like, you got to let that go. So I dispersed my cleaning business to my girls and they started their own business, which was great. <clears throat> I didn't even have time to find a buyer for my cleaning business. I had 85 clients, but I didn't have time to find a buyer. That's how busy I was. And so in the first year, we, I opened February 21st, 2008. By the end of 2009, by the end of 2009, we had 12 stores open. Wow. 2010, we had 32 stores open. 2011, we had 65 stores open. And then I had, I had a baby and by myself. I'm a single mom. And I had a baby traveling with me. She's been on 89 plane flights. It's craziness. And uh, I, it's just been such a blur. But what has stuck with me is that I was a perfectionist in the old thing I did, right? And wanting a higher standard that I fought for those higher standards. Even when my franchisees were, oh no, we want to do, no, you're putting peanuts on top of that peanut butter cupcake right now. You know, I mean, I was that person because that was so important to me, the small stuff. And so I think that's why we grew because of my passion for wanting, if not perfection, we can't ever be perfect, perfect. But for the best, for some for an experience. And that was what was so important to me. So that's why we grew so fast. It was just the right timing. It was the right cupcake, the right smell, the right, it, everything was, it was just the right timing. But it was also my passion and my love for growing something and growing a brand that I really, really believed in. Well, what lessons do you have for us? For me, specifically even, for a franchisee listening, what lessons from franchising um, can, you, can you convey to, to all of us listening? Because that's, whether you're talking to me or the 85 stores that we have open, these are all small business owners. They're all franchisees. Um, anyone that's already been down that road, you know, what, what's something you can remember that can maybe be helpful for us? You can't fake passion. And you can't fake some, someone being caring about someone else. You can't fake that. You can't fake the passion and you can't fake hard work. So if you're trying to get out of the working hard or the passion in the business, you will fail. You have to have passion for your customers and passion to do the right thing at all times. Because that you can't pretend. People know. You have to be genuine. So I think right. that's the best thing is being genuine and being passionate. You can train someone to do whatever, to bake or to vacuum a floor or to, but if they don't have the passion and they don't have to have, the, they don't have that customer service of wanting to work hard, you cannot train that in someone. Someone has to have that desire within. And so when you're looking for employees, that's the number one thing. If they don't have the passion, it's not going to work. Yeah. And we even say that with our franchisees, you know, I, I we yeah. love our franchisees. I personally um, think you of them. You don't have the passion for it. No, I don't care if you have all the money in the world, you want to invest in a, a two maids and a mom, you want to buy and you want to take over five, sto five states. If you aren't passionate, you're not going to be a good franchisee. And that's what I would tell all my franchisees. If you don't mm -hmm. love what you're going to do, don't do it. Well, you know, one of the, one of the unique things about your story, um, you know, I read so many, I'm a complete nerd when it comes to business books. I've way, I read way too many of them and yours, <laughs> one, yours is one of the ones I've read. Oh, What's so unique about yours is it's real. You know, so, so many of these books seem like, you know, someone started poor, 
they had an idea, they worked hard, and then they became the gazillionaire, and right. it was all perfect. Uh, but you have some imperfections in your in your story, you know, and that you're you're open about. So what as as the business was growing, uh, kind of take us to lead us to where you even are today. You've got a whole new rebirth even going on, which I think is pretty cool as well. Well, I thank you for asking and reading my book number one. And it, <laughs> it is was great. Thank you. It's extremely vulnerable. I've, I've heard that from most people. Like, gosh, your book is so like you just lay it out there. But if you're genuine, you have to be vulnerable. And if people don't like you or people like you, you've just still got to be yourself. So that was really important when I was writing the book. And what I learned through my 12 years of GGs is that I wasn't really a public person. I mean, I would sing and I would be on stage, but I didn't know customer service. And so going through this whole 10 years, 12 years, I didn't really appreciate the customer like I should have because I was growing and I was looking at the peanuts on the cupcake. And, you know, I had all of this stuff I had to do and growing franchisees and vetting out places and franchisees and people. And I didn't really practice the art of really taking care of my customers and not, and not as good as I should. And looking back now and going through, I sold Gigi's and took it to 120 stores, but sold the franchise part four years ago. And then I just sold the, my final Gigi's six or three months ago. And I completely went through a whole, who am I again? My identity crisis. What am I going to do with my life? And what I really realized is I love people and I love customers. And I've decided to reinvent myself with pies by GG. I'm going to do a pie shop. And what I want, I don't want to franchise. I'm not going to franchise because it's just not for me now. I've done that. And what I want to do is I want to have a place where people can come and I can really, I could feed them a piece of pie or a shepherd's pie or a chicken pot pie. But I could really minister to them through customer service because now I know that that's what I want. I want people to come in and feel like it's a safe haven and I can appreciate the customers. But it's taken 12 years for me to really realize that that's what's important. You know, I don't know if you thought of it like this, but you know, I know your early motivations and dreams were to become this music entertainer, this this you know, country music star. Um, it almost sounds like that's, even though it's not necessarily via music, you're wanting to entertain today. And so you're kind of going back to those early roots. That's right. <laughs> I mean, that's what I love to do the most is entertain, cook for people in my home and feed them. And so it's entertaining. It's just in a different form. And that's why I think it's so important to recreate yourself. People think, oh, I just have to do this one thing. Well, maybe it is what you just said. Maybe entertaining, but in a different form. Right. That, I'm getting back to my true love, and it's entertaining and being with people. And, and helping people to just feel safe when there's such a scary world right now. I want them to walk in, smell the place, smell like home, order a piece of pie, and go, this is where I want to be right now. And I want to be there to share my life with them and let them share their life with me. Well, Gigi, it's been a lot of fun catching up with you and, and talking personally with you. Your book was just fantastic. I wish we could have uh, talked a little about some of those Broadway late night stories, <laughs> but maybe that maybe that's a whole other podcast. Getting my, getting my butt pinched, <laughs> passing the tip jar around. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I bet it's so surreal right now. Uh, oh. The virus outbreak. Oh, I know. It's so funny. But you, thank you so much. And um, if you all would like to know more about my book, it's called The Secret Ingredient. And it's everywhere books are sold or a on Amazon. And uh, if you wanted to connect with me via social media, it's official GG Butler on ggbutler.com or Instagram or Twitter or uh, Facebook. So it's official GG Butler. Well, and for, you know, we do have franchisees that are in middle Tennessee. So uh, make sure if you're listening, you know who you are, uh, reach out to, uh, is, it, is it shop by, it pies by gg.com? Is that how you do, is that how you, it's a you, connect? you can, I'm, I'm actually doing delivery and takeout in my home right now in a commercial space. 
And then when my storefronts open, of course, I'll have one store, but my goal is to ship across the country. So you don't have to be in Middle Tennessee to experience a Gigi's pie eventually. Well, you're going to kill it. I know you are. You, you've, <laughs> already, you've already proven that a couple of different times. And so, you know, these things come in three. So you're going you're gonna to make it work. And whenever you, whenever you take over the world, let's get back on here and talk again. <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank you so much. I can't wait to meet your franchisees. Maybe at one of your conferences one day. Absolutely. Let's make, let's make that happen. Well, thank you so much for having me. All right, thanks, Gigi. Bye. Hey, guys, Beth Lovett in business development. If you enjoyed this episode, then please share with your friends and don't forget to tune in to the next episode of Cleaning Up. Have you ever wondered if you wanted to be in business for yourself? If so, then don't hesitate to give me a call at 205 789 8027 or email me at bethl at ineedamade.com. And if you just want to window shop, then you can see us online at twomaidsfranchise.com.